after positive of that, well, what we do first, we swap subject and predicate. And so from no cats to dogs, we get no dogs or cats. And then we replace each of those terms by their complements. So instead of saying no dogs or cats, we say no non-dogs are non-cats. Okay? And that sentence would be the contrapositive of the claim with which we, we began, no cats or dogs. Now, here's the thing about contraposition. <clears throat> it's really the opposite of what we said for conversion. In particular, if you start with an A claim or an O claim and contrapose it, you'll be guaranteed to get a claim that has the same truth value as the claim with which you began. Okay. <clears throat> so, for example, if you start with an A claim and find the contrapositive of it, well, that contrapositive, if the original claim was true, will also be true. Okay. But not so for E claims and I claims. Okay. okay, so that's the four relations along the square, contrary, contradictory, subcontrary, subalternation, as well as the three transformations conversion, obversion, contraposition. If you can keep those seven things in mind, then you'll have a mastery of the square of opposition. Now, here's something very interesting we can do once we've got a hold of how these relations and transformations all work. We can start really doing what is ultimately the beginnings of symbolic logic. So, for example, suppose we start with a certain claim. Let's say the falsity of the idea that some P's are not non-Q's, something sufficiently fancy like that. Let's write this down. So we're going to start with this claim. It's false. What sort of claim is it? It's an O claim. And the O claim relates P's and non-Q's. false that some p's are not non-q's. So we have it's false that a certain O claim that is true that relates p's and non-q's. Now suppose that what we want to do is to show that given this starting assumption we can in fact prove that another sentence is true. In this case let's try uh, a certain E claim that says that no q's are p's. E claim, no Q's or P's. Now, given all those facts we just rehearsed about how these different relations and transformations work, contradictory, contrary, conversion, and all the rest, well, we can instruct, in fact, construct a certain derivation or proof of how we get from this claim to this one. Okay? This is what's happening at the end of Stories Chapter 9. This gets into some pretty hairy stuff, but it's really all based on these fundamental facts about the relations described in the square and the three transformations. So let's see if we can do this derivation. Well, first, let's apply the relation of the contradictory. Right? We're starting with the falsity of an O claim. Now, the notion of contradiction tells us that of a pair of contraries, one must be true and the other false. So if we start with a false O claim, well, its contradictory will be the corresponding A claim, and since the original claim is false, the corresponding A claim must be true. Okay? So let's use that fact about contradiction to write down our second line, which will say that all P's are non-Q's. By the way, I'm using a little n capital Q to denote non-Q's, the complement term of Q's. Sometimes you'll, in certain texts, the complement term will be written with a little bar over the letter like that. Q and Q bar together make up the whole word. Here I'm just going to use a little n to denote non. Okay, so to get from line 1 to line 2 we use the relation of contradiction. It's a feature about the notion of contradiction that allows us to move from line 1 to line 2. The contradiction, uh, the contradictory property, that is, the relation, tells us that of two contraries, one is true and the other false. And since we start by assuming that one is false, we know that it's contradictory 
uh, must be true. Namely, that all P's are non P's. Okay, well, we're getting close to our, our goal sentence of the idea that no Q's are P's. How, there's one step we need in the middle. <coughs> so, first, let's uh, let's obvert this line we got here and see what happens. Now, remember to take an obverse, you slide along horizontally along the square of opposition, and so here what we'll get is an E claim, and then we want to replace the predicate term with its complement. Now, in this case, the, co the, the predicate term is already non-Qs, and so when we take the complement of that, non-non-Qs, or Q bar bar, if you like, which, of course, is just Q. Okay. So if we take the obverse of this line here, we get no Ps or Qs. That's by obversion. Well, now we're home free. Because to get from no P's or Q's to no Q's or P's, all you have to do is to perform a simple conversion. And we'll recall that this is justified because conversion preserves the truth value of your, of your categorical claims as long as they're E claims, which we have here, or I claims. And so what we have here is, in effect, a proof in heavily symbolic notation of this claim here given this top line as a kind of starting assumption or premise. Well, that's the beginning of symbolic logic. If we want to increase our formalization and increase our powers of uh, capturing the truth values and how they, uh, of, of uh, certain claims and how they relate to one another, well, we're on the road to do just that. But I think that's more than enough for now, so we'll stop here. Good luck.